The San Antonio ISD superintendent heading to Chicago for a new job. We've got the latest details this noon. People continuing to deal with damage and power outages in the aftermath of Hurricane Nicholas. Now crews from San Antonio are stepping in to help. Jonathan Cotto has details. Live from KSA 12. The news at noon starts right now. New at noon, we have new developments in the murder of a 15 year old on the city's west side back in January. Now someone's facing charges for that deadly shooting. Police say they arrested 20 year old Zachary Vargas and charged him with murder. According to arrest paperwork, the shooting happened back in January in the 500 block of Bell Cross. Police say surveillance video shows the suspect was standing in front of a home waiting for the victim. That teen was supposed to sell something to the suspect when the victim arrived and the suspect got into a fight. And at some point, one of them pulled out a gun. That gun ended up in the hands of the suspect. Police say he shot the victim in the back. The victim was taken to the hospital where he later died. This noon, we're learning more about the detention deputy who was arrested after the sheriff's office says that he assaulted an inmate. BCSO identifying that deputy as Peter Martinez. He's charged with assault, bodily injury, and official oppression, rather suppression. Sheriff Javier Salazar says that surveillance video showed the detention officer assaulting an inmate after that inmate got mouthy with the detective. The inmate was taken for questioning and decided to press legal charges on the detention officer. No one was seriously hurt. Also near this noon, an investigation underway on the southwest side. Police say a fight ended with one person hurt, another one dead. When officers arrived at the 200 block of Bartholomew Avenue, the victim had already been taken to the hospital and the second victim was being rushed away with life-threatening injuries. Police say the suspect went to one of the victim's homes. Then they got into a fight that resulted in two people getting hurt. The victim was pronounced dead at a local hospital. At last check, the 34-year-old suspect was being questioned by homicide investigators. U.S. Border Protection officials now learning more about these two children. They tell us that agents found these children abandoned along the Rio Grande near Eagle Pass yesterday. It's a two-year-old girl and a three-month-old boy. They were found on the riverbank by agents who were performing boat operations. There was a note under the baby carrier seat CBP, CBP officials said that the children are siblings. They are from Honduras. They did not require medical attention, so they were taken to Uvalde for processing. San Antonio ISD Superintendent Pedro Martinez has been named the new CEO of Chicago Public Schools. That announcement made in Chicago at his alma mater high school this morning where Martinez spoke at a press conference. Sarah Costa has what he said and his message for the San Antonio community. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Pedro Martinez, a son of Chicago, back home. Pedro Martinez is leaving SAISD, where he has been superintendent since 2015, to be the CEO of Chicago Public Schools. The mayor of Chicago praised Martinez, calling him a historic pick for the position, saying he is the first Latino to be the CEO of Chicago Public Schools. An immigrant from Mexico who came to Chicago and grew up right here in Pilsen. His public education journey began at CPS. Martinez says he is excited to be coming back to his hometown where he was part of the Chicago public school system since he was six years old. A city that I love, a city where I grew up, where it all started for me. My father uh, brought us to this country. As for when Martinez will leave SAISD in the very near future, he says he will be starting in Chicago at the end of the month. Martinez released a statement this morning saying he will always deeply care about San Antonio ISD. He says, quote, although I'm leaving with a heavy heart, I know this district will not skip a beat in its pursuit of excellence on behalf of our children. And SAISD clearly has the depth of talent and skill to move gracefully forward, end quote. Once again, that was Sarah Costa reporting. CPS Energy crews making their way to Houston in the aftermath of Hurricane Nicholas. Hundreds of thousands in the Houston area left without power. CPS Energy says they are mobilizing these crews in response to a request from Centerpoint Energy. As Jonathan Coulter reports, the crews are excited to respond and ready for the challenge. 
Early start for CPS Energy crews who are gearing up and getting ready to make their way to Houston in an effort to help restore power to 400,000 residents who have been left without electricity after Tropical Storm Nicholas making landfall early Tuesday morning as a Category 1 hurricane. CPS journeyman lineman Frank Stakes has been with CPS Energy for over 20 years and says they are experienced, equipped, and ready to take on any challenge. As far as it being a challenge, that's one of the things that the linemen here at CPS look forward to. The harder it is, or, or it seems, the bigger the challenge, the more we want to tackle it. And that's what these guys are out to do. Overhead linemen, pull crews, fleet personnel, and safety teams attended a briefing this morning held by leadership at CPS Energy's Eastside Service Center. If you need anything, let us know. President and CEO Paula Gold Williams addressing the crews and wishing them well. You've got a great job to do, and I just so appreciate you. CBS Energy's Chief Operating Officer Fred Barneywell says they will be focusing their efforts on restoring power to residential communities. This is really the core of who we are, and we're, we're really good at getting power back and, and getting it restored. So I have 100% confidence in our team and our dedicated support to this community and the state of Texas. And will serve San Antonio proud. CPS says the 32 personnel heading to Houston will be there for up to five days. By now, crews should have arrived at the Centerpoint Energy staging area at the San Houston Raceway Park, where they'll be receiving their assignments. They say they are ready to get the job done. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. 20 years ago today, the only bridge connecting South Padre Island to the mainland collapsed, sending drivers into the water. This was just a few days after 9-11, so it was first thought to be a second terrorist attack. Well, a memorial and ceremony just wrapped up on the island where that accident occurred. John Paul Barajas has the story. In the very early morning hours of today, 20 years ago, a barge crashed into a support beam for the causeway, causing a large section of that causeway to fall into the water, followed by 11 drivers who couldn't stop in time, falling over 80 feet. Eight of them died. Today was about mourning those lives lost. Think about this, not every anniversary day, but almost every day. As I cross that spot on the causeway on a daily basis, there's not too many days that go by when I don't think about what. And that was the former mayor of South Padre Island. He was the mayor at the time of this tragedy and he went on to say they've built a stronger causeway today and it's held up for many years but the most important thing was that over the years they built a stronger community and his former residents continued resilience is what he's most proud of today on this anniversary at port isabel john paul barajas ksat 12 news Thank you, John Paul. Back here at home, a traffic alert to tell you about a major road closure affecting a busy stretch of Hebner Road on the city's north side. Hebner Road is closed in both directions between Lock Hill Summa and Vance Jackson because Union Pacific Railroad will be working on the tracks in that area. Drivers may want to find it hard to get around or may find it hard to get around and navigate those closures, so they might want to look for alternate routes. There are also lane closures on Lock Hill Summa and Orsinger Lane is closed for a voter approved 2017 Vance Jackson low water bond project. Public's work officials say the closure on Hebner will end tomorrow. You can get a closer look at it on KSET.com. Seeing some clouds this morning. We'll see some clearing this afternoon, some hot temperatures too. We've got the latest on your forecast coming up. And another honor for Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond. Larry Ramirez with that coming up in sports. This weekend, the San Antonio Museum of Art is teaming up with four local artist organizations to garner community support. And KSAT producer Priscilla Caraman explains, while SAMA is filled with an extensive collection of creativity and history, the building itself has a story of its own.
The Lone Star Brewery is an iconic brand, of course. It was started here in San Antonio in this very place. Built in the 1800s, what we now know as the San Antonio Museum of Art was originally the Lone Star Brewery Complex, a place for blacksmith shops and bottling departments, to name a few. When Prohibition came around in the 1920s, the brewery was forced to close. The building reopened several times as a cotton mill, ice factory, and even an auto repair shop before it finally became SAMA in 1981. And a group of visionary San Antonio leaders got together and looked at this old building and said, hey, that'd be a pretty art museum. Once the museum was established, the owner of the Lone Star Brewery sign, which once sat at the top of the building, donated the artwork. 40 years later, the sign will serve as the backdrop for an upcoming virtual gala benefiting the performing arts. The museum will set the stage for four performances by the youth orchestra, the chamber choir, the ballet, and the public theater. We, five organizations, got together and decided that we're stronger together than we are individually. Mary Birch, the chief development officer of SAMA, says, Following a year of uncertainty brought on by the pandemic, the virtual event is more meaningful than ever. The museum was fortunate because we could open our doors after a closure of nine weeks, but the performers couldn't perform. They couldn't have an audience and they couldn't be together. This is a really special time to get all of these groups together. Priscilla Karaman, KSAT 12 News. And if you would like some information about how you can watch this virtual performance, all you have to do is head over to KSAT.com. When you get there, you're also going to find a link to support the Museum of Art and other organizations involved. Still keeping an eye on the weather to our east, but here, lots of clouds. Clouds are helping us out today. I mean, we're only at 78 degrees. I think temperatures, if these clouds hang around a little bit longer, which it looks like they will, Maybe down a bit this afternoon. We'll take it. We're getting closer to fall. We're almost there. The aquifer is down a tenth of a foot to 659.8. We're still in stage one water restrictions for sauce customers. And in your pollen counts, very fallish. Fall helm and ragweed, both uh, both up there in the moderate category. Those are your fall allergens. We'll take a look at the seven-day forecast, which does include a few rain chances coming up. So usually we're like in the high 80s, pushing 90. So yeah. Go outside and enjoy this, huh? Yes. It's noticeably cooler. These clouds help. Yeah. And we're starting to get to that time of year where the days are getting a little bit shorter. So we start to get some of these morning cloud decks. And if they can stick around, it does help the outcome during the afternoon. Now, these clouds are beginning to break up. We're already starting to see some sun there in eastern parts of Medina County. Here across Bear County, it's only a matter of time. I'd give it another hour or so, and I think the, these clouds will clear out. But we did lower daytime highs a little bit because of this cloud deck, which is on the back side of Nicholas. 77 in Randolph, 77 Seguin, 79 New Braunfels. We're at 81 right now in Pleasanton. Still a lot of clouds out towards Kennedy and Gonzales, too. You're in the upper 70s there. But look, the, look at the difference it makes if you're outside of this cloud deck, almost 90 now in Catula, 86 Carrizo Springs, close to 90 in Del Rio. So places that are seeing the sun are going to warm up much, much more quickly. Uh, outside right now, we're seeing, uh, again, the cloudy skies. Uh, 81 Stinson, 77 Kelly, 77 at Randolph. And a good northeasterly breeze, anywhere from 5 to 15 miles per hour. Humidity is not too, too bad. We're still in the muggy territory, but it's not the oppressive, so that's helpful. And I think dew points will kind of hover right there in the 60s today. There will be a little, maybe a little bit of a heat index, but you probably won't notice it that much. Rest of today, expect partly cloudy skies. Temperatures up near 92. East northeasterly winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. Yesterday we were at 94. Uh, but if the clouds hang around even a little bit longer, we may lower this some again into the low 90s. Uh, forecast highs today, 92 Kerrville, 95 Uvalde, 98 in Del Rio, 91 Gonzales, 98 in Cotua. So it is still going to be a warm day. Don't let those clouds fool you uh, by the afternoon. We'll uh, still see those temperatures really ramp up. Here is Nicholas. You can see the spin right there. With this storm, it's always been lopsided. The, the heavy rain and all the action has been on the east side of this uh, circulation, and that continues today. Very heavy rain, New Orleans up towards parts of Mississippi and Alabama, even Atlanta seeing some heavy rain at this hour. And for parts of uh, southeast Texas and here across central Texas, we're seeing some clouds on the backside of this circulation. Uh, there is uh, Nicholas, still uh, just a tropical depression, but really starting to fall apart. It's really just a rainmaker. 
bottom line. And there's another little disturbance in the upper parts of the atmosphere that will come down into Texas next couple days. This will be a player in our forecast uh, going forward. Meantime, let's look at the tropics real quick and uh, we'll show you what's going on there. Uh, there are a couple systems worth watching one way out in the Atlantic. Uh, the chances of this developing 80 to 90 percent. So there's high likelihood here. And then there's another system uh, off the East Coast that has a high likelihood of developing both of these. Uh, well, this one we can watch. This one will stay away from the Gulf. It is forecast to move north. But if we do get another named storm, it would be Odette followed by Peter and Rose. Those are the next names on the list. Here's what our future cast looks like. I mentioned that little disturbance coming out of North Texas that may kick up a shower or two on the coast Friday. And then on Saturday with it sort of hanging around a couple of showers possible same on Sunday. But I'll tell you your weekend plan should be just fine. It's a, it's a 20% chance of rain. I think it's a hit or miss shower. Not a big deal. And this begins to move east by late on Sunday. Still a slight rain chance on Monday. Warm temperatures next few days, 94 Thursday up to 96 on Friday. A couple showers this weekend, mid to low 90s for highs. And that'll be the same next week. Now, if we look past Tuesday, there are some indications that maybe we can get a front. Let's not get too excited yet, though. We'll see how it, play, it plays out. Hopefully, we get some sort of a cool down by the end of September, guys. Yeah, late summer. Thank you. Yep. Good thing Becky Hamm's not playing anymore. She wouldn't have any jerseys to wear. <laughs> Keep hanging them from the rafters. I know, right? And I mean, she deserves it very much to have those, have her number 25 retired, which we will talk about coming up in sports. We're also going to talk about Cowboys' Terrence Steele from Steele High School. He's going to start at right tackle for the boys. And after one game, Texans' running attack is improved. Coming up. undrafted played 16 years I wasn't supposed to be here but here I am so thank you very much WNBA great Becky Hammond received a cool honor Monday night in big board sports pro football coverage powered by Davis law firm Steel high school alum Terrence Steele were started at right tackle Sunday when the Dallas Cowboys faced the LA Chargers in Los Angeles that's after Lyle Collins was suspended for five games for violating the NFL substance abuse policy Steele in his second year in the NFL started 14 games last season after Collins missed all of last year following hip surgery Jerry Jones broke the news about Steele during his weekly radio show plan is to go with Steele and uh, he'll do a good job. He's a young guy that we're proud of, and uh, uh, he really had a great rookie year last year, relatively speaking, and uh, he'll do a good job out there. We'll give him lots of help. Cowboys signed wide receiver Robert Foster to their practice squad after placing Michael Gallup on the injured reserve list with a calf strain, meaning Gallup will miss at least the next three weeks. The Houston Texans are prepping to face the Browns in Cleveland Sunday. That's after the Texans were able to beat Jacksonville in their season opener at home 37-21. In that game, the Texans had four active running backs and they combined for 160 yards rushing. Running back David Johnson also caught the first touchdown pass by Tyrod Taylor as the Texans Texans starting quarterback. Oh, it felt great. It's always a good thing to score touchdowns on offense um, to help out the offense, help out the team, get the morale going, especially when everyone has us losing. It's always good to, you know, come out and score touchdowns and get a victory. Now they will see if they can score on the road when they face the Browns in Cleveland at noon on Sunday, where the Browns are 11 and a half point favorites. The New Orleans Saints are dealing with a COVID-19 outbreak as they prep to face the Carolina Panthers in week two. It's being reported that eight members of the organization tested positive for COVID-19. The total includes six coaches, one player who is on injured reserve and a nutritionist. The six coaches and nutritionists are fully vaccinated, according to reports. For now, the entire team is operating under the NFL's enhanced mitigation protocols, meaning mandatory masking inside facilities, daily testing, no in-person meetings, and grab-and-go meals. I'm extremely humbled and honored, and uh, I hope to carry on uh, the impact that, that the Aces have had, the Stars have had, and the WNBA has had. Thank you very much. In case you missed it, Spurs assistant coach Becky Hammond had her number 25 retired Monday night at halftime of the Las Vegas Aces WNBA game. Hammond played for the San Antonio Stars in 2007-2014 before they moved to Las Vegas in 2017. Her number is already retired in the AT&T Center.
Now she just needs that head coaching job. There you That's go. All. Next on the list. That's it. All right, Larry, thank you. New today at five, the new season might mean that you'd be pulling your fall decor out of the storage. Well, you might come across some things that you've been holding on to and you no longer need. If it's time to declutter your space, coming up today at five, 12 on your side's Marilyn Morris explains the three questions that could help you better determine whether something should stay or needs to go. Happening right now on Capitol Hill, Olympic gymnast superstars, including Simone Biles and Ali Raisman, all testifying in front of the Senate Judiciary Committee. This hearing is examining how the FBI failed to respond to allegations of sexual abuse against former USA Gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser. ABC's Elizabeth Schultz reports from Washington. A blockbuster hearing on Capitol Hill. The hearing will come to order. Star gymnasts Simone Biles, Michaela Maroney, Maggie Nichols, and Allie Raisman giving emotional testimony about how they were sexually abused by former USA Gymnastics doctor Larry Nasser. To be clear, I blame Larry Nasser, and I also blame an entire system that enabled and perpetrated his abuse. Nasser was sentenced to up to 175 years in prison in 2018 for molesting hundreds of gymnasts. And in actuality, he turned out to be more of a pedophile than he was a doctor. Senators are now asking how the FBI overlooked these painful accusations and bungled its investigation into Nasser. As the details of Nasser's crimes emerged, there's been a consistent theme of neglect and inaction by those who are responsible for protecting the athletes. The FBI had two separate opportunities to do its job, and it failed. In a scathing report in July, the Justice Department Inspector General found FBI agents failed to respond with the urgency required once they learned about the allegations in 2015. The report said FBI agents then tried to cover up their mistakes. The agency's failures allowed a sexual predator to continue to abuse more than 70 young women. That is inexcusable. FBI Director Christopher Wray also testifying. He was not in charge of the agency at the time of the investigation, but the FBI has said its handling of the case was appalling. Sources tell ABC News one special agent who the DOJ Inspector General called critical to the Nasser investigation has been fired. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, Washington. California Governor Gavin Newsom won a recall election aimed at kicking him out of office early. The win ensures the nation's most populous state will remain in Democratic control. The election came four months after a grassroots petition to remove Newsom from office gained momentum. Newsom has faced criticism for his handling of the COVID-19 pandemic in California. The Justice Department requesting a federal judge now to issue a temporary restraining order to block enforcement of the controversial Texas abortion law. The law, which passed in May and went into effect earlier this month, bans abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. The legal brief comes after the Biden administration filed suit against Texas last week, saying the law is in open defiance of the U.S. Constitution. The request could move quickly through the courts, ultimately landing at the U.S. Supreme Court. It could determine whether clinics in Texas can once again perform abortions after the six-week limit. The Supreme Court allowed the Texas law to remain in effect, though, earlier this month in response to a separate legal challenge. North and South Korea both tested ballistic missiles today. The displays took place just hours apart from each other. The tests are sure to raise tensions between the rivals at a time when talks aimed at stripping the north of its nuclear program have stalled. ABC's Julia McFarland has more. North Korea upping the ante, firing two short-range ballistic missiles across its east coast in violation of numerous UN resolutions. Traveling nearly 500 miles before landing in the waters between North Korea and Japan. The Japanese Prime Minister calling the launch outrageous. It's a dramatic uptick in activity after months of quiet. 
yesterday. Pyongyang breaking that silence, launching long-range cruise missiles, saying those newly developed weapons successfully travelled nearly a thousand miles. Just hours after the North tested its ballistic missiles, South Korea announced the latest test of their first submarine-launched ballistic missiles, a 3,000-ton class submarine hitting its target. The timing, they say, was coincidental. Even China calling for both sides now to show restraint. The U.S. military says the missile launch poses no immediate threat to U.S. personnel or American allies in the region, but that the launch serves to highlight the destabilizing impact of North Korea's illegal weapons program. Julia McFarlane, ABC News, London. Looking outside with live cam, it is a chilly almost. <laughs> 78 degrees with all that cloud cover. Yeah, she's thinking about that cold. Isn't Dare she? we say chilly? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's it's uh, definitely cooler than what we've been seeing. That is for sure. And you're right. The clouds really helping us out a lot this morning. Uh, that's, that's now early this afternoon. It's keeping temperatures down a little bit. Let's look at the numbers. 83 in Holotus, 78 in San Antonio. Holotus starting to see a few peaks of sun. You'll start to see a few peaks of blue sky through those clouds here momentarily as these clouds are starting to break up. And uh, give it another hour or so. We should be seeing some sun here in San Antonio, and that will boost the temperatures. In the meantime, still in the 70s. 80 in Divide, 83 out there in Uvalde where skies are clear. And there's a look at the airport right now. Uh, temperature 78, 2.66 in the northeasterly wind at about 8 miles per hour. If you're thinking about rain chances, eh, there's not much to look at here. We do have a few over the weekend, a passing shower or two, but nothing of great significance. And we need some rain now. We're starting to get back down close to having a deficit, at least at the airport. So some rain would be useful. It's not, uh, not again, there's not a lot in the forecast going forward. 92 this afternoon, as long as those clouds break up, northeast Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. Then falling into the 80s tonight. We'll talk more about that weekend forecast and what you can expect coming up here in just a couple minutes, guys. Thank you, Justin. Starting today, the IRS is distributing its third child tax credit payment. Most parents will receive up to $300 for every child six years or younger and $250 for each child between six and 17 years old. After today's distribution, the IRS will have three more monthly payments to send out this year. Then the benefit ends until Congress extends it. Democrats are currently looking at extending the tax credit as part of their budget reconciliation bill. SpaceX set to launch the first all-civilian crew into orbit. How they trained for their first time in space, right here on Earth. And our BGC teammate, Texas Sports Production, has a big one for us on Thursday. Larry Ramirez will be taking a look at the number seven ranked Taft Raiders and Marshall coming up in sports. Two pairs of glasses with jewels for lenses from the 17th century in Asia are expected to fetch millions of dollars, but the pricey lenses might be might serve more than just one purpose. Details on the special significance after the break. How about these glasses? May seem like something Elton John would have worn in the 70s, but they're actually from the 1600s. Right now, these glasses are on tour through New York, Hong Kong, and London. They're going to go on sale, though, during an auction, and they're expected to fetch up to three and a half million dollars. They are thought to have belonged to royalty from modern day India. And what makes them so special is the jewels used to craft them. One pair is called the Halo of Light. It features lenses cut from a diamond that may have been 200 carats. The other pair, called the Gate of Paradise, has lenses believed to have been cut from a 300-carat emerald. Some people at one point believe these jewels had special significance, and looking through them could channel good luck, ward off evil, and offer a glimpse into paradise. I guess their version of rose-colored glasses. Yeah, I would hope it would be paradise for that price. Yeah. Okay, the first ever all civilian flight crew now heading into space. SpaceX Inspiration 4 mission is set to take off today with four civilians ready to orbit the Earth for three days. But before these passengers blast off, they had to train for 
what it'd be like in microgravity. Zero Gravity Corporation uses a modified Boeing 727 flying in parabolic motion to create multiple spurts of weightlessness. The crew blasting off today, they acclimated themselves to zero G's on one uh, flight before, uh, on one day before the flight, today's flight. You don't want your first experience in, in zero gravity to be in space. And it's a very unique feeling. And this gives them the framework to understand it. The inspiration is set to whip around the planet once every 90 minutes. And after three days, the spacecraft will dive back into the atmosphere and splash down off the coast of Florida. They're like scientists, and I think there's a there's a veteran on there who's a, like a scientist now, and of course the guy who bought the tickets is like some tech billionaire or something. So he, he paid for everybody to go or something like that. They're not cheap, those tickets. Everyone gets a space flight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're a tech billionaire. That's right. Uh, so far today, 78 degrees, guys. It's been uh, somewhat of a cool day because of cloud cover. The low this morning was 70, so we've only gained 8 degrees. The average is 90. We'll be close to that until once the sun comes up, or comes out, I should say. And uh, we may even go a little bit above that. The record is 98, set back in 1953. That is not in jeopardy. A few showers over the weekend. A look at that forecast is coming up. This Hispanic Heritage Moment is brought to you by Taco Cabana. The charro and the charreria has its roots dating back to the 16th century and played a very important role on the Mexican haciendas and is the forerunner to what we know today as the American rodeo. During the Mexican Revolution, the large haciendas were divided up and fearing the loss of the charro traditions, the Federación Nacional de Charros was formed in 1933. The oldest association in the United States is right here in San Antonio where continued traditions and skills of the charros are on full display at a Charriada. Not only do men take part in the events, the ladies in the Escaramuza teams impress the crowds with their carefully crafted choreography, which has been described as ballet on horseback. The San Antonio Charros Association's goal is to preserve the history, art, and culture of horsemanship from Mexico for future generations. All right, yesterday we had a Cajun language test for Sarah Spivey. Oh yeah, what well, you remember what it was? Yeah. It was the it was the canoe thing. Well you just gave it away. I was gonna I was oh, gonna I'm sorry. give a pop quiz to just Justin. Happy I remember what I was I was telling Sarah the the folks in Louisiana, a couple of them called me yesterday and said we're getting in our P rogues and going to the grocery store. A P rogue. Okay. No I, I have no idea what that is. A canoe. Okay. A Cajun canoe. <laughs> I've learned something new. I feel good about this. See, he wasn't even paying attention when I when I blew it. So, <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I mean, well, I'm, now I know it's a canoe. I, I didn't know what I was going. But yes, thank you. Good information. Uh, I want to give you some more information too. Uh, space station flyover tonight, uh, 8:42. It's going to last about seven minutes. Uh, appears from the southwest. It'll disappear to the northeast. Always cool. Let's check it out. If you want to do so tonight. Watch Should your be. arm, Justin. Sorry. Yeah. Watch out. Get in the way. I want to get it cut off. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, check it out tonight. Should be, be cool. good viewing for that if you want to. Uh, let's go outside for you. Cloudy skies and uh, calm conditions. Uh, not a lot of rain here. Obviously, uh, over the last few days, as much as not as much as we had hoped. All that rain now, well, into Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama this afternoon. 78 degrees right now. Cloudy skies. Dew point is at 66. Feels like 80 outside. There is just enough humidity to create a little bit of a heat index. 79 Randolph, 77 Canyon Lake, 78 Comfort, 84 Hondo, 76 right now in Lost Maples, and up to close to 90 in Catula. So these areas you see here are under full sun. So temperatures are warming up much, much faster there across the central part of the viewing area. A lot of bit of uh, quite a bit of cloud cover, and so that's uh, keeping those temperatures down for now. Two points in the 60s. For the most part across the board here. This doesn't really change much, so it's going to be somewhat humid, but not overly so during the afternoons. It won't feel too, too bad. Forecast high temperatures today into the low 90s here in San Antonio. Once we lose the clouds, 93 in New Braunfels, 91 Gonzales, and then you'll get some much warmer readings down to the south and west. 98 in Catula, close to 100 in Del Rio. So we're still in the summer heat. There's a look at that cloud deck that's been there most of the morning. This is sort of on the back side of Nicholas. And it's been holding strong right over Bear County, Comal County, out to Guadalupe County, but starting to break up some, and we're seeing it shrink. Probably will take a little while longer before it completely goes away. 
and you can see the swirl in the atmosphere is still there by Nicholas. It's kind of stalling out a little bit, and that's a problem because there will be a lot of heavy rain from New Orleans east, New Orleans into Mississippi, Alabama, even up towards Atlanta, where there is some heavy rain at this hour. Uh, I want to show you some stats here. This is really pretty fascinating. Over the last couple of years, these are the land falling tropical systems that we've seen, and there's 14 of them in total. So it just shows you how busy it's been the last two years. Louisiana is really taking it on the chin. Ida, Zeta, and Laura, while major hurricanes it made landfall in Louisiana. But Texas has also seen its fair share with Nicholas. We've had uh, Hannah, Beta, Nicholas, and uh, Laura was close, right on the edge there. So it's been busy in Texas too, but uh, just a uh, pretty impressive last couple of years when it comes to the tropics and more specifically there in the Gulf of Mexico. Here's what our future cast looks like. No tropical weather for us anytime soon. Future cast shows a little disturbance working in the northeast Texas tomorrow. By Saturday and Sunday, it'll be around. It's not necessarily strong and there's not a ton of moisture to work with, but there could be a few showers over the weekend and even into Monday. Right now, we're just putting in a 20% chance. So the seven day forecast calls for a low to mid 90s next few days, 20% chance of rain Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and the temperatures hold pretty steady right there in the low to mid 90s, guys. Hope we get a little more rain out of that. Yes. Thanks. As if college football wasn't exciting enough, now we start to get some teams into conference play. Yeah, UTSA opens up, <clears throat> pardon me, Conference USA play this Saturday at home against Middle Tennessee. And it's a team they are certainly looking forward to playing coming off their first career shutout in franchise history. Plus, Aggies quarterback Zach Calzada, we're being told, was cool under pressure up in Denver. Coming up. Starting their season with a win against Illinois on the road and scoring the first shutout in program history in their home opener against Lamar 54 0. The UTSA Roadrunners kick off playing Conference USA this Saturday when they host Middle Tennessee, a team they barely beat last season 37 35 to go 5 2 in conference play and should have been in the Conference USA championship game during the COVID 19 pandemic. But that went to the University of Birmingham at Alabama and the West, who played less conference games, and finished 3 1. Those facts and Mother Nature led to what happened yesterday morning as the team returned for workouts. We had two things working to our advantage. One, Middle Tennessee really got after our tails last year, and we all felt out we were very fortunate to win the ball game. It's a conference game, so that got everybody's attention to begin with. And then, man, the weather was just fantastic. I don't remember the last time I coached with a jacket on on September 14th. So it was a dry day. It was a cool day. We had a breeze. It was just a beautiful morning. Uh, and our kids really responded with our, with our best practice of the year. I think we're more locked in. Uh, you know, it's a conference game, big game for us. So uh, I think we're more dialed in. and uh, Attention to detail is a lot better. Kickoff in the Alma Dome against Middle Tennessee is set for 5 p.m. Saturday. UB1 at Texas A&M, Haynes King suffered a broken leg in the Aggies 10 to 7 win at Colorado on Saturday. It happened when King was trying to scramble and was taken down by linebacker Guy Thomas in the first quarter. He'd returned to the sidelines on crutches, but according to reports, underwent surgery on Sunday and is now out indefinitely. Zach Cazada came in and went 18 of 38 for 207 yards and one touchdown, tossing the game winner for the Aggies late in the fourth quarter. So how was Calzada late in the game with all the pressure on him to come up with the win? He was positive. We all kept a positive vibe. Nobody pointed fingers because we don't do that. It's not the standard. And um, we all just wanted to win. Um, Zach still showed that. Um, Zach got comfortable towards the end of the game. I feel like Zach's going to be really good for us down the line. Um, He's going to get more comfortable, more practice time. So we're going to be ready. Aggies will host New Mexico this Saturday at Kyle Field at 11 a.m. The Case at 12 MeTV Texas Sports Productions Game of the Week will see a battle of the unbeatens to continue playing District 29-6A when the Marshall Rams meet the 7th ranked Taft Raiders at Gustafson Stadium live on Case at 12.2 Thursday night. Both teams are 3-0 overall and 1-0 in district. This is a big game for both because it's the next game on the schedule. Having the momentum off a 3-0 win streak is very big going into a big game like this. We take every game uh, as a big opportunity and very seriously, and we bring it in practice every day to make sure we win this game. It's kind of a rivalry game, I'd say, because last year we uh, had a pretty close game against them, and we, we messed up a couple times, but then we came, fought back towards the end and then fumbled in the fourth quarter and lost the game. So I, could see, we, I would see it as a rivalry. 
kickoff at the Gus on Thursday, set for 7 p.m. And you can see it live on KSAT 12's MeTV, thanks to Texas Sports Productions. That'll be a good one. Yes, it will. All right there. Thanks. And it's going to be a good essay live as well. <laughs> yes, we are celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month and Mexican culture with La Familia Cortez. Yes, and Gerardo Carajal, who is the general manager, is here. And of course, we are talking about food. What are we making today? We are cooking 200 years of history today. Oh, it all started gosh. on this night. This 200 years ago. Okay. And, and then that's what it was created for, to celebrate the independence from Spain. And of course, yes, it is tomorrow, and all sorts of going on. And boy, I'll tell you what, we have been digging into this food because it's really good. It's so good, y'all. Okay, all right, you want to catch a free. Well, oh, we have, yeah, well, that's oh, right. we've got something to wash it down too. We've got these wonderful cocktails, and it's going to be quite a history lesson, so I hope you're going to be ready to take notes on the cocktails. All right, and now, in our deal of the day, we're going to yep. tell you how you can catch a free movie. Yes, and if you want to catch Fiona driving, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be hard to catch me because you got to get behind the wheel and you will never look at a turn the same way again. We show you how to get fast and furious with Texas Drift Academy. Yes, and we have a very special interview with actor and comedian Rob Schneider. We interviewed him yesterday. It was right after he found, a, found out about his dear friend Norm McDonald's passing, and he is just celebrating his life. He's going to be in town this weekend, and you're going to hear from him coming up a little bit later on. Okay, all that and more when SA Live continues in just a few minutes.